Let's turn now to a second focus of Grover Norquist's ongoing activities benefiting his Islamist friends and their agenda. His efforts to promote in Republican circles candidates with ties to Muslim Brotherhood fronts, mosques, and influence operations. Recall the description of Norquist's Americans for Tax Reform by one such group, Muslims for America. It says very explicitly that ATR is, quote, looking for Muslim leaders state by state to participate within their monthly meetings for creating relations with top political leaders and Muslims. Three examples illustrate the kind of Muslims Grover Norquist has been helping connect with top political leaders. First, Kamal Nawash, a Palestinian-American lawyer shown here with three public figures fitting that description, a cabinet officer in the Bush 43 administration, the governor of one of the nation's largest states, and an iconic former Republican congressman and vice presidential candidate. In the course of his second try for public office in 2003, following a defeat in a Virginia House of Delegates race two years earlier, Nawash was found to be keeping other, more troubling and illuminating company, Abdurrahman Alamudi, who just happened to be one of Kamal's clients at the time. In early September 2003, Alamudi wrote a fundraising letter for Nawash's campaign for the Virginia State Senate. The letter said in part, quote, I am urging you today to ask that you join me in supporting Kamal Nawash. Toward that end, I have personally contributed money to Kamal's election campaign, unquote. In fact, Alamudi and his wife, Shifa, made the largest single contributions to Nawash's campaign. Unfortunately for the candidate, Alamudi's fundraising letter went out shortly before the al-Qaeda financier was arrested on terrorism charges. While Nawash ultimately returned the money, he said of al Moody that, quote, he's just a liberal Muslim who wants more Muslims to be involved in the U.S. military and politics, to be part of America, unquote. He also dismissed the charges against al Moody as baseless and politically motivated. In the end, Nawash lost his race for the state Senate against a woman he denounced as a, quote, mean-spirited racist, unquote. He subsequently also lost in 2007 a bid to lead the Republican Party of Fairfax County, Virginia, another campaign strongly supported by his friend Grover Norquist. Then there's Faisal Gill, a Pakistani-American attorney. Gill worked for Abdurrahman Alamudi at two of his Muslim Brotherhood fronts, the American Muslim Council, and the Islamic Free Market Institute. During his tenure as the AMC's Director of Government Relations, Gill lobbied to secure the prohibition on secret evidence so assiduously sought by Samuel Arian, Grover Norquist, and others associated with the Muslim Brotherhood's influence operations in the United States. What's more, Faisal Gill also worked in two firms prior to the November elections in 2000, Gill and Gafur, and AG Consulting Group. Let me give you a little background on Gill's partner in those enterprises, Asim Gafoor. Paul Sperry, one of the nation's leading investigative journalists and authors, reported that, quote, Gafoor is a Saudi lobbyist who has been caught up in U.S. counterterrorism investigations, unquote. Sperry observed that, quote, according to lobbying disclosure records on file at the U.S. Senate, he has lobbied on behalf of specially designated terrorist organizations, including the Saudi-owned al Haramain Islamic Foundation, which the Treasury Department says has acted as a charitable front for al-Qaeda. In fact, Gafur lobbied Treasury to take al Haramain and one of its U.S.-based directors off its blacklist and unfreeze their assets. Unquote. Paul Sperry also recounted how Gafur once used an Islamic forum to beseech Muslims to Islamize America. He quotes Gafur as saying, quote, We are here for a purpose. We are here not to just be nice to people, but to bring Islamic ways to this country. Unquote. On that occasion, according to Sperry, Gafur also declared with regard to the U.S. system of government, quote, I believe it's our duty that it is minimized and, inshallah, Allah willing, one day eliminated. Despite Unquote. these troubling connections, with help from Grover Norquist, his sponsor at the Islamic Free Market Institute, Gill managed to obtain a series of positions in the Bush administration that dealt with extremely sensitive matters. 
These included a stint at the Department of Homeland Security, where he served as senior policy advisor to the Undersecretary for Information Analysis and Infrastructure Protection, and as policy director for the department's intelligence division. Gill also worked as deputy general counsel for policy at the Office of Personnel Management. Gill also served as a lawyer at the White House Homeland Security Council and as principal counsel to the president's Critical Infrastructure Protection Board. In June 2004, Salon Magazine described Faisal Gill's background for the job and the sort of sensitive information to which this former employee of a top Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda operative was given access. Quote, A White House political appointee with close ties to Republican power broker Grover Norquist and no apparent background in intelligence, Gill has access to top-secret information on the vulnerability of America's seaports, aviation facilities, and nuclear power plants to terrorist attacks. Unquote. Curiously, in his application for a security clearance in connection with his Homeland Security Department post, Gill did not disclose that he had worked for Abdurrahman Alamudi. He did, however, list Grover Norquist as a reference. Such a failure to make a full and truthful disclosure could rise to the level of a felony offense. At a minimum, it raises serious questions about whether there was a security breach. When the FBI discovered it in March 2004, Gill was briefly removed from his position in the Homeland Security Department's intelligence organization. He was reinstated, however, after what have been described as, quote, a series of interagency meetings, unquote, in which presumably the unhappiness of the White House Muslim outreach team about the suspension was made known. As with questions about Suhail Khan's Muslim Brotherhood associations, concerns about Gill's relationships have been deflected or dismissed on the theory that background checks for security clearances would have turned up any problems. At the time, though, Senator John Kyle of Arizona was chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee's Subcommittee on Terrorism and Homeland Security. He expressed serious reservations about Faisal Gill's failure to disclose his ties to an indicted terrorist. The then Inspector General of the Department of Homeland Security, Clark Irvin, investigated this apparent security breach. While Gill subsequently claimed that the investigation fully cleared him, as Paul Sperry recounted, quote, the DHS Inspector General didn't exactly exonerate Gill. He concluded only that he could find no evidence that Gill had falsified relevant information or intentionally omitted it. Sperry went on to note that subsequently, quote, Irvin questioned why Gill was ever hired for such a sensitive post in the first place. In Irvin's book, Open Target, the former IG asked rhetorically about Gill, quote, should anyone even remotely connected to terrorism be employed by Homeland Security in any capacity, especially the ultra-sensitive area of intelligence and infrastructure protection, unquote. Good question. After leaving government, Faisal Gill practiced law. He garnered what appear to be considerable amounts of money from unidentified sources and made at least $25,000 in political contributions. In 2007, he ran for a seat in the Virginia House of Delegates with strong support from Grover Norquist, Suhail Khan, and their friends. He lost the race and claimed he was, quote, attacked, just because I am of the Islamic faith, unquote. Do you see a pattern here? The pattern would appear to be not only that Muslims with ties to Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamist operatives enjoy Grover Norquist's reflexive support. These two, however, had other things in common that contributed to their defeat, besides such associations. Notably, they lacked sufficient clout in GOP circles, apart, that is, from Norquist. One other piece of the pattern is the default to personal attacks on opponents using epithets like racist, bigot, and Islamophobe. As we've seen, these are hallmarks of the left, zealously employed by the Islamists and used routinely by their nominally conservative agent of influence, Grover Norquist. Enter Norquist's latest Muslim protege, a Lebanese-American businessman named Imad David Ramadan. Ramadan's insinuation into GOP circles was facilitated by his opaque 
personal history, unclear sources of funds, much of them from unidentified sources overseas, and vast political contributions that have earned him friends in high places throughout the Republican Party apparatus of Virginia. In fact, so successful was Ramadan's networking in Virginia that he was tapped to be the vice chair for the Old Dominion's Republican Party ethnic coalitions. Interestingly, that was the credential Ramadan used when, on August 17, 2010, he was the lead signatory of an open letter published on the New York Times webpage. It criticized Republicans and conservatives who opposed the construction of the Ground Zero Mosque. Among the other self-styled active members of the Republican Party who signed the letter were Grover Norquist's wife, Sama, and Suhail Khan. In 2010, when Ramadan ran for a new open seat in the Virginia House of Delegates, he received the enthusiastic endorsement of 23 Republican federal, state, and local elected officials, most of them politicians to whom he had generously contributed. Such officials included three of the rising stars of the Republican Party in Virginia and nationally. The GOP's second-ranking official in the U.S. House of Representatives, Majority Leader Eric Cantor, Virginia Governor Bob McDonald, and Virginia Attorney General Ken Cuccinelli. All three endorsed Ramadan despite serious questions that dogged his campaign. Several voters in the 87th District asked a county court to determine whether Ramadan actually resided there and, if not, that he be declared ineligible to represent their constituency. The morning of the hearing, Attorney General Ken Cuccinelli endorsed the candidate and two Commonwealth's attorneys moved to quash a subpoena for the results of a state police investigation into the true location of Ramadan's residence. Some of the questions that make such political endorsements bizarre and potentially future liabilities for the endorsers were explored by investigative reporter Ken Timmerman in an article published by David Horowitz's Front Page magazine. Entitled, Grover Norquist's New Muslim Protégé, it illuminated that the candidate's family in Lebanon included a major general in Lebanese intelligence known to be tied to the Syrian regime of Bashar Assad, and Iran's proxy, the terrorist group Hezbollah. Here's what Mr. Timmerman had to say with regard to what that relationship suggests about Imad Ramadan. Imad Ramadan's campaign biography indicates that the candidate, quote, completed graduate studies, unquote, at four universities here and abroad. It's unclear how he paid for such educational endeavors, however, given that Ramadan had declared bankruptcy while in college in the United States. More to the point, Ramadan transformed himself in ways that have not been fully disclosed from an individual who was bankrupt while in school in this country to someone who came back to it, a very wealthy man. So wealthy, in fact, that Ramadan has sufficient means to have made political contributions to various Republican politicians and organizations. As with the sources of his payments for postgraduate studies, the provenance of such funds and precisely how Ramadan obtained them remain unexplained. The lessons learned produced at last a win for Norquist and his effort to credential Muslims as Republicans to create relations with them with top political leaders and get them elected. Even so, the extremely narrow margin of victory reveals how hard a sell are such individuals of uncertain character, sources of funds, and background. But expect Grover Norquist to continue trying to elect more of them, with additional candidates who have ingratiated themselves with their campaign contributions to Republican Party leaders and organizations. In Part 7 of our course, we'll examine the myriad ways in which Grover Norquist has been advancing the Islamists' agenda in this country and continues to do so.